Good morning. It is the second Sunday in Lent, and we welcome you to our morning worship with the parish family of St. George's Anglican Church in London. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, you speak the words of life to us. In you we find our heart's desire. By your grace we are made whole. When the way forward is unclear, you shed light. When we are troubled, you give peace. When times are difficult, you stir courage and hope. Our deepest longing is to know you and to be known by you. In these difficult days, we give you thanks for your faithfulness to us. Draw near to us in our time of worship, O God, and open the way before us so that we may follow Jesus without wavering, trusting him to lead us. But first, let us remember the things we have done, the words we have spoken, the thoughts we have had, which got in the way of the good you would have us do, and the love you would have us live out in our day-to-day -day encounters. And so together we say, Gracious God, although following you brings joy, we confess the way is sometimes hard for us. There are times we get tired and would eagerly settle for an easier road. Some days we find the task of loving others hard. Sometimes we choose anger over forgiveness. Some days we ignore the needs of our neighbors. Forgive us when our commitment to you wavers. Forgive us when we take that easier path. Stir the embers of our devotion and kindle a brighter flame. Strengthen our determination to follow where you lead and renew our energy to serve in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the collect for this day. Faithful God, may we set our minds and wills to yours and take up our cross, following Christ with confidence for the glory you reveal in him who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multiple of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. 
I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. We join together in our canticle for today, God's plan of salvation, as together we say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with all spiritual blessings of heaven. God chose us in Christ before the world was made to be holy and blameless and to live in his holy love in his presence. God planned through Jesus Christ to bring us to himself as his children that we might praise the glory of his grace his free gift to us in the beloved. In Christ, we gain redemption. Through his blood, our sins are forgiven. How rich is the grace of God. A reading from the book of Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm at the point in Lent in this particular year when what I really want is for us to speed through this season and come to Easter Sunday so we can say our hallelujahs, go home and have Easter brunch, eat chocolate bunnies, look to new life and new happiness in what will be our new normal with all of this nightmare behind us. But this Sunday, this second Sunday in Lent, the Spirit is whispering in my heart, not so fast. There are decisions that have to be made. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. We, we start with our Old Testament lesson, and, and, and what a great reading it is. It's a lesson that takes us to Abraham, the patriarch, of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. We go to see Abraham and he has a visit from God. And, and there's a marvelous part at the start, which is so horribly translated in, in our New Revised Standard Version, where we hear the words, I am God Almighty. That's a terrible translation. In actual fact, the Hebrew translates more like, I am the God of the mountains. Think about that. I am the God of the mountains, the God who would meet Moses and Elijah and Jesus on mountaintops and change, change the history of the nation, change the history of humanity. I am the God of the mountains. And then he says to him, walk before me. And, and El Shaddai, the God of the mountains, 
is not talking about starting a parade. What he's talking about when he says, walk before me, is listen, Abraham, every step you take, every move you make, every action you do, every decision you make needs to be made in reference to my will, to my plan for humanity, to my plan for the world. And then he goes on to say, and be blameless. And, and at this point, he's not saying, and you need to be spotless, you need to be without sin. What he's saying to Abraham is, listen, you need to be whole, entire, complete. You need to be the best you you can be. You need to be the best version of yourself. El Shaddai, the God of the mountains, saying to Father Abraham, walk before me, live in relationship to me, a relationship that directs your life, and be the best you that you can be. And if you do that, then I will be your God. And not only does he say to him that he would be his God, but he makes a promise. He says, I will give you descendants, you who, who, who and, and, and your wife, Sarah, you will become the patriarch and the matriarch of a nation, of many nations, the future of humanity. And, and not only will I give you descendants, but I will give you land, land that will be yours and yours for all time. That promise, descendants and land, became the core of the narrative of all of Hebrew scriptures. And along with the promise, whenever life got hard, came the question, would Yahweh, would El Shaddai, would the God of the mountains remember his promise to his people, would that God even be able to keep his promise? It seemed almost impossible. Remember, when, when El Shaddai made his promise to Abraham, who was 99 at the time and his wife Sarah was 90, that they were going to have offspring and become the progenitors of a nation, Abraham fell on his face laughing. It seemed ludicrous. But Yahweh, El Shaddai, God, is the God of impossible possibilities. Okay, when Jesus began his ministry, the question on the hearts and the minds of the people of Israel was, can God, will God remember his promise to us? Is God able to keep his promise to us? Because they felt like they were in exile in their own land. Their land, which was God's gift to them, had been usurped by the military might of Rome. And to make matters worse, in Jerusalem, the holy city, the Mount of God, their political and religious leaders, the ones they were supposed to turn to and count on, had become their oppressors. In the midst of their pain and their suffering and their fear, the question was, where is the God of impossible possibilities in all of this? Well, Jesus' disciples, they followed him because of his preaching and his teaching and his healing and all that he did and, and in all that, that he said it seemed to them that the vision of the prophets, the hope of the nation, resided in him. 
They believed that this Jesus, who took for himself the title Son of Man taken right out of the book of Daniel, they believed that he was a difference maker. They believed that he was the one who was going to change things. And so on the road outside of Caesarea Philippi, a place that was built in honor of Caesar, a place where there was an altar to Pan and a shrine to Caesar, Peter made the statement, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. And, and let, let's be clear what Peter was saying. He was saying, listen, the revolution is about to begin. Jesus, the Messiah, is about to take charge. And, and with God on our side, victory is assured. It was an exciting, it was an electric moment, but the electricity lasted for only a few seconds. Because Jesus said to Peter and his disciples, listen, there will be no armed revolt. There, there, there will be no coup. You do not replace empire with empire. It doesn't work. There will be no coup. There will only be a cross. Let the rebuking begin. David Lose, who writes a blog called Left Behind and Loving It, says that Peter's vision for the Messiah is the one which we usually would want and embrace because Peter's vision of a Messiah, that's one if we were honest with ourselves, is the one that we cling to. See, it's the picture of a God. God who is powerful. A God who heals our illnesses, gives us prosperity, cares for our security, urges our teams on to victory. A God who keeps us happy and healthy and wise on our way to heaven. But Jesus points to a God who comes to us in vulnerability, in suffering, in loss, and in death. He points to a God who comes to us when we need God most. He points to a God who comes to us when everything that we have worked for, everything we have hoped for, everything that we have lived for is falling apart. See, Jesus points not to the God that we want, but to the God that we so desperately, desperately need. But he wasn't finished with them yet. He went on to say to his disciples and to those who had gathered around, those who were on the road, listen, if any of you, any of you want to be my disciples, then you need to take up your cross and follow me. And, and I think, I am sure, I am sure what Jesus means by that is to take up your cross. To take up your cross is to discover what life really means. The invitation to take up your cross and follow me, it is a reiteration of El Shaddai's words to Abraham. El Shaddai said, walk before me and be blameless. Jesus, the one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, 
are in the life, was saying, walk before me and let every decision you make, every act you take, every step that you take, be in reference to my will and my way, my truth in my life. And, and that means that the invitation to take up your cross and follow Jesus is an invitation to put, to put pride and power and prestige and success as the prime motors, prime motivators in life, to push them away and instead take on love and mercy and kindness and empathy. The invitation to take up your cross and follow Jesus is an invitation to engage, to embrace a community that exists, to care for the sick and the suffering, to feed the hungry, to include the outcast. To say, take up your cross and follow me is an invitation to become part of the redemption, the redemption of humanity. I believe that on this second Sunday of Lent, this scene in scripture, which was initiated by Jesus saying, who do you say that I am, leads to an unspoken question, which is who are you willing to be? As church, as individuals, who are we willing to be? The God of the mountains, Yahweh El Shaddai said, I will be your God, but you need to walk before me and you need to be the best you you can be. And then, I will be your God and you will be my people. The question is, are we prepared to really be God's people? Or is it easier for us to keep God at arm's length where there are no demands? No demands. Jesus said to his followers, if you want to be my disciples, take up your cross and follow me. His followers did not sit around the campfire talking theology or sit around boardrooms strategizing about how to keep the institution going. They got up and went out and they changed the world in Jesus' name. The question for us, I believe today, is are we going to commit ourselves to the God who is concerned about our prosperity, the God who cheers along our teams, the God who walks with us on the way to heaven, taking care of every whim, every need that we might have, or are we going to turn to the God that Jesus pointed to, the God of vulnerability and suffering and loss, the God who says to us, take up your cross and follow. Who are we willing to be? Who are we willing to be? It's the question for Lent, the question that we all need to answer in our own time and in our own way. Amen.
Now let us respond to the proclamation of the word as together we say the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Loving God, we thank you for the vision you have for our lives, the promises you have made for, to us, and the journey you open before us. Today, we remember with gratitude the ways our lives are held secure in uncertain times by our trust in you. Moments in these months of pandemic made, that made us laugh or smile. Moments when we felt your gifts of courage and patience. Times when you helped us overcome temptation. The people who love us and give us encouragement. Gracious God, we are grateful for all these signs of your love in our lives. Thank you for the hope they bring us. Show us how to share this hope and love with others who are struggling in these difficult days. Faithful God, we pray for healing and restoration in the world that is our home. Hear us as we name in silence the needs and concerns we carry today. We pray for people, places and situations deeply in need of your grace, especially as they face the fear and frustration of coping with COVID-19. We pray for those who struggle to feed, clothe, or house themselves and their families, and all those who worry about their economic future. We pray for those who are weak or vulnerable for any reason, and for all who lack dignity and respect in our community. We pray for the earth and its well-being that areas and species under threat will be cared for. We pray for peace and justice in regions of the world facing turmoil. And we pray for all those offering leadership and service in these times of hope and anxiety and for those planning how to offer vaccines in our community, and for those uncertain about vaccination. By the power of your Spirit, O oh God, work in us and through us, may we bring the light and love of your kingdom into our relationship and our community in all we do and say. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So go now and try to live before God in openness and integrity, 
Set your minds on the ways of God, not clinging to your own life, but taking up your cross and following Jesus. And may God give you a share in the eternal covenant. May Christ Jesus be proud of you when he comes in glory and may the Holy Spirit make you grow strong in faith and lead you in the way of righteousness. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.